안녕하십니까? Welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed lunch. And we will start the afternoon session on progress and prospects in Korean studies by region with professor, professors from China, Japan, Vietnam, and more, also from the Middle East and Central Asia, who have prepared a wonderful session, I am excited to say. This session will be moderated by Professor Kim Dong-tek of Seogang University. Professor Kim established the Korean, Global Korean Studies Department in Seogang University in 2012 and has been teaching there ever since and is also the director of Global Korean Studies Initiative. Professor Kim, you have the floor. Uh, hello, everyone. As introduced, I am Dong Tae Kim from Seogang University. It's a great pleasure to moderate session two of the 2022 KF Global Korean Studies Forum. In session one, we talked about Europe, North America, and Latin America, and the Korean uh, studies present in those regions, and session two will be covering other regions of the world, including Africa, uh, Middle East, Central Asia, and Oceania. We will have presentations from uh, professors from respective regions. Presentations uh, will last for 15 minutes, and then the remaining session will be a lot good for Q&A. Uh, uh, let me briefly introduce you to our speakers today. Uh, to my uh, originally, we were to have uh, our professor from China to come. However, due to disease prevention and control measures, well, we weren't able to have Professor Tan Wang come in person physically. He will be joining us online, and we have Professor Nihino Junya from Keio University and from the Ho Chi Minh City University of Social Sciences and Humanities, we have Professor Ting Pong Mai Nguyen. And from Australian National University, we have Professor Roald Maling and Kay. Thank you very much for joining us. And from St. Petersburg State University, Professor Sergei Krufbanov. Thank you and welcome. And we have from the Kazakh. Abilai Kang University of International Relations and World Languages, uh, Professor Hu Jong Chang. And uh, we have from Cote d'Ivoire, Professor Hyung Huang. And from Ain Shams University of Egypt, Professor Sarah Benjamin. Thank you very much for joining us. So then, we would now like to first invite uh, Professor Dan Wang from Peking University on the Korean Studies Development Path in China with a future-oriented future -oriented vision. So let us now invite him on the screen. Uh, to all the scholars, it's a great pleasure to meet you all. I am Dan Wang from Peking University. I would first like to congratulate the opening of the 2022 KF Global Korean Studies Forum. And I would also like to extend my gratitude to President Kun Lee and all organizers at KF for giving me this opportunity to present before you. Due to unfortunate circumstances, I wasn't able to meet you in person, but I am grateful to have this opportunity to at least join you online. The topic of my presentation is Korean Studies Development Path in China with a Future-Oriented Perspective. Uh, we will soon uh, um, commemorate uh, the diplomatic ties between Korea and China. It will be a 30th anniversary, and it's a great pleasure to host and ho engage in this presentation at this pivotal year. I have a lot of slides, but due to time constraints, I would like to just focus on some key points. Before I go into the presentation, let me first go into the implications Korean studies have in Korea. 
So Korean studies in China, as a part of area studies, it has to do with humanities, social sciences, as well as natural sciences. So it includes uh, Joseon, the history of Joseon, uh, Korea, and the Korean Peninsula. So it's a overarching type of discipline in China, and it particularly has the purpose of promoting the cultural ties between Korea and China. Uh, Korean studies in Chinese universities uh, is my next topic, and I would like to mention that uh, we first started off with the department at my university, and we have more than 77 years of experience of Korean studies. We have the earlier years, uh, the stagnation period, the transitional period, and uh, the development period, or the growth phase. So in terms of quantity and quality, we've been seeing some exponential uh, growth. Uh, if you look at the number of departments of uh, Korean studies, there are more than 260. And you can see that four-year universities amount to 125. And we have 141 three-year colleges. And in terms of the number of professors and students, we have 2,000 in faculty and 40,000 in terms of students. And then you can see that Korean, after English in Japan, is uh, the third important foreign language in China. And not only that, recently, if you look at the Korean studies in universities, they're also focused on nurturing next generation scholars. And we can see that universities have started to introduce graduate courses. You can see that there are about 36 so with a master's and a PhD program in Korean studies. I believe that we have uh, some technical issues right now. I think there is an issue with uh, the internet connection. So once again, I do believe that we do have some technical issues right now. If you bear with us for just a moment, we try to have the issue fixed. Thank you. Uh, I believe that we may uh, need some more time to resolve the technical issues, so if you may allow me, I would like to invite the next speaker uh, on the stage for the presentation, and once uh, we restore the connection with our professor in China, we will continue on with our presentation. So yes, uh, Professor uh, Nishino, would you like to begin? Good afternoon, and I would like to start my presentation. I am from KU University in Japan. My name is Nishino Junya. I would first like to thank KF for inviting me to this important forum. And congratulations on the 30th anniversary of your founding. I would like to take this short time to introduce the characteristics and the tasks remaining for Korean studies in Japan. As you are well aware, Korean studies in Japan has quite a long history. In session one, we briefly discussed what is Korean studies. Uh, Korean Peninsula and South Korea are the subject of Korean studies, uh, in my definition. 
So although Korean studies has a long history in Japan, I would like to focus on the past 30 years I uh, Korean studies has developed in Japan with KF because I will be saying as I will be saying later up until today the Korean studies and research by Japan in and on Korean Peninsula started in the early 20th century and uh, the 30 plus years, uh, 30 odd years of colonial rule by Japan are deeply related, and this is an important point to remind ourselves of well, for democratization of Korea. I really want to focus on Korean studies for the democratization of Korea. And each period and important events in each period are closely related to the Korean studies. And when it comes to Korean studies in Japan, the Seoul Olympics was the biggest trigger for the development of Korean studies in Japan because in 1988, the Seoul Olympic was held. And in 1984, earlier, NHK station in Japan actually started the Korean language program. And that was when really interest in Korea uh, really started to grow in Japan. And then uh, democratization of Korea had a huge impact as well. Although this was not included in my slide because by, through by uh, democratization in Korea, the Korean researchers and researchers in, Korea, in Japan started to have academic exchanges really um, earnestly because in previous to that period, under the authoritarian rule, um, Korean studies and scholarly research was limited. So the academic exchanges in its truest sense was quite limited. So democratization of Korea and in the 1990s uh, was really when uh, Korea, Japan academic exchanges started to take off and Korean studies in Japan started to develop quite rapidly. And another trigger was the 1998 joint declaration by Kim Dae-jung and Obuchi. There was also the Korea-Japan World Cup and the first wave of Hallyu. So in the early 2000s, uh, this was when Korea-Japan relations were at their height. And there was even greater interest in Korea among Japanese people. And there was active research on Korea uh, by Japanese scholars. And as we saw during the opening video, uh, during this time at the Kyushu University in Japan, the Center for Korean Studies was established based on the joint declaration and agreement in 1998 when PM uh, Kim Jong-pil visited Kyushu University. And at the KO University in 2009, the Contemporary Korean Research Center was established. I think this was the very first center um, established in my region, and then the Waseda University and Tokyo University also followed suit. So in the 1990s, Korean studies in Japan uh, became quite robust, and in the 2000s really met its peak. But unfortunately, since 2010, and to be exact, 2012, Korean-Japan relations started to deteriorate, which had a negative impact on Korean studies in Japan. So what are the characteristics of Korean studies in Japan? I can say with pride that Korean studies in Japan and studies of Korean Peninsula in Japan is really at a world-class level with its rich and long history and tradition. And because Japan and Korea have share similarities in terms of culture, language, and value. And so um, Korean studies uh, scholars in Jap Japanese universities are able to read Korea, Korean, and they have uh, easier access to primary sources. And we are geographically quite uh, closely located, so we have had some very active exchanges. But these characteristics nowadays, I don't know how to put it, 
seems to have dissipated. The edge that Japanese scholars had uh, has really gone. And that remains a task for Korean studies in Japan. The biggest task remaining, or the biggest challenge, I would say, is that Korean studies in Japan, in terms of its power to disseminate, is very, very weak, because all of the research published are in Japanese or Korean. But in the past, Korean studies professors because Korea-Japan relations had very deep relations, um, there were many, many uh, scholars who were able to read uh, Korean or Jap Japanese uh, resources. But now most of the resources published are in English. And so research in Korea faces a crisis of disappearing in Japan. And this has been an issue for the past decade. The second task remaining, as I have mentioned briefly, is particularly for political scientists like myself. Political impact on the Korean studies is quite huge, and recently the political impact has been quite negative because Korea-Japan Korea relations have been quite in bad shape uh, in late in, in the recent years, and considering the bad relations we have, uh, we cannot be very hopeful about how many students there will be that take an interest in Korea. But during the Cold War period also, there was huge political impact as well in the 1980s. I said earlier that uh, Korean studies, there was a huge dispute over what language to use for Korean studies, Japanese, Korean, English. So there was a huge political impact on Korean studies in Japan. And I believe that in a sense, such political impact continues on to this day. And uh, Korea-Japan relations is, are deteriorating, having even worse impact. And lastly, the geographical proximity with Korea or accessibility to Korea, Korea all the edge that Japan, Japan had is now fully gone because of COVID. And as we discussed over lunch, without such edge, Japanese scholars had an environment where Korean studies were easy to pursue, but now the environment is quite different and the task remains with on how to pursue Korean studies. So I would like to conclude my presentation just on time. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Junya, for additional for your short but very uh, important presentation. And earlier, Professor Sergei also mentioned um, national studies, Korean studies, and the Joseon studies in Japan with a long history. So the relations between the three fields uh, is very important and deep-rooted uh, for us to understand Korea, and the root continues on until this day. Young European or American uh, scholars may not be very familiar, but the older generation, uh, like my generation, looked into the national studies and Chosun studies and some key points that re actually led to a research topic for many of the American or European scholars. So in the 21st century, Korean studies as a very important background to Korean studies, um, national studies, the uh, Korean studies, and Joseon studies uh, have had a huge impact. And it's important to understand such a background. And for uh, discussions, I believe that um, Professor Nishino did not uh, delve into, dive into uh, the topic, but um, it is still a very important topic. But we are still waiting to reconnect with Professor Wang Dan, so we will move on to the next presentation.
Yes, we would now like to invite Professor Thi Peng Mai Ning Gong. Hello, everyone. As introduced, I am Thi Mung Mai from the Ho Chi Minh City University of Social Sciences and Humanities. Today, I would like to talk about the present state of Korean studies, education, and research in Vietnam. Yes, uh, let me swiftly go into my presentation. So first, I would like to talk about the current status, a brief introduction uh, of the college, and what kind of challenges remain, and ways uh, to solve or overcome these challenges. So first, let me talk about uh, the college and the departments uh, that are established. In Vietnam, we have North, Central, and the Southern regions. It consists of these three regions, uh, both North, Central, and South. And as you can see here on the chart, from 1993, uh, we've uh, seen at uh, the uh, VNU Hanoi University of Social Sciences of Humanities establish a Korean Studies Department. And I identified uh, 43 universities or colleges with Korean studies related departments at the time I submitted my paper, but now uh, there are 50 universities and colleges uh, that have such departments. You can see that especially the universities and colleges in the southern area have many uh, relevant courses, and then the north and the central. And if you consider the Korean language department, uh, there is more of such than other Korean related departments, but we also have interpretation and translation or education or Korean studies related departments in some of these other universities and colleges. In the 1990s, you can see that there weren't that many schools uh, up until 2000 that had such departments. But you can see that in 2010 and onwards, we've seen a great increase in the number of departments established. In 2020, 21, and 2022, the number of uh, universities with Korea Korean or Korea-related departments are on the rise. So let me now briefly go into the demand for uh, Korea studies or Korean language education. So here, you can see that for you to enter into a college or university, you have to. There is an elective uh, subject that you have to choose from, and whether it be if you do want to uh, major in Korean studies or the Korean language, you have to or you can select out of these three subjects, and the total score is thirty points. In the case of Hanoi uh, USSH, uh, you need to get the full 30 uh, points in order to enter into that college and major. And uh, as for the other universities, you can see that you can see that out of the department, it's probably the top five most difficult departments to get enrolled in because you really need to be a top student to join that course. And if you look at these other universities, you can see that uh, there is a greater popularity for Korea or Korean language related departments. And in the case of our university starting from last year, you can see that uh, Korean studies overtook Japanese studies and, uh, in terms of the uh, actual score or the grades that, uh, or the test score of the students uh, that joined the university. It depends on the year, but you can see that we have around 200 and 300 students uh, that would get enrolled, enrolled in this department. We have around 200 or so every year. The total number of uh, schools, uh, the total number of students, excuse me, is uh, 800 plus. And there are universities that have more than 1,000 plus students in Korean studies or Korean language. So we do call it the Korean studies, but it's true that many of the departments or colleges are focused on teaching the Korean language. And with regard to research, I did uh, do my research here, but there aren't that many research centers. But uh, one thing that I do want to boast about have to do uh, with the KRAV, which is a research association on Korean studies in Vietnam. So here, you can see that we 
don't have any other uh, research associations that focus on a particular study of a country. Uh, Korean Studies uh, Research Association of Vietnam. This is actually the only association in Vietnam that focuses on the studies of another country. And K the support from KF has been um, invaluable in the process. And then we also have the Center for Korean Studies of the Institute of Northeast Asian Studies at the Vietnam Academy of Social Sciences. We don't have as many resources as of yet. Uh, and also we have at the University of Education at Ho Chi Minh uh, University, they do have uh, a Center for Korean Studies, but it's not that active. And as I've already mentioned, here at the University of Social Sciences and Humanities, we also have a Korean uh, Studies Center. But if you go into the contents, it's not more so on the Korean Studies per se, but it's focused on uh, Korean language. and. Yes, it also does host uh, academic seminars from time to time. And this is the Korean Studies Application Center uh, within the university. So what we want to do is put together publications, conduct online uh, education courses, put together a platform uh, to offer more online content to our students. And at the University of Education of um, uh, VNU Hanoi, we do have this uh, Korean Studies Center in the, the College of Korean Language and Culture, and I know that it has been supported by the Academy of Korean Studies in putting together this program. Our uh, college was established in 1994, and uh, for the 28 years, KF was uh, a active supporter of all of our programs, colleges, and departments. And this year, for the first time, we've introduced a master's course on Korean studies, and we've uh, selected our first batch of graduate school students uh, to 25 students. In 2010, uh, we've uh, become an independent department, uh, starting from our history of 1994. And then in 2015, we've now established a college. And these are the departments under the college. It consists of departments on language, literature, um, culture, social sciences, political, economic, foreign affairs, and e-learning. And uh, we have 25 students uh, and uh, you can see that uh, the faculty uh, we host hold PhD degrees and these are the support uh, programs of KF uh, there are still some challenges in terms of literature, statistics, resources. So it's true that uh, there are some limitations in engaging in research. And the lack of faculty, uh, lecturers, textbooks, educational materials is also another challenge that we have. So I truly hope that we can continue on with or engage in joint projects with Korean universities or Korean studies centers. And I think that this could definitely help us resolve the challenges at hand in Vietnam. That is all for my presentation. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for that. So the presentation uh, was on the VN, on VNU Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh, the University of Social Sciences and Humanities, and also the um, University of Languages and International Studies in the North that have started off with Korean studies. And you can see that there's a lot of investments that would go into this program. And you can see that it's very well received by the students. But irrespective of the demand that we see amongst the students, the um, professors mentioned that we may need some further advanced courses or master's, PhD courses, and also the nurturing of faculty and lecturers. And I believe that KF and other support institutions can take that into account in rendering further their support. Uh, fortunately, we have uh, restored the connection with Professor Dan Wang, so we would like to continue on with her presentation.
Yes, uh, Professor Tan Wang, please. Yes, my apologies. Um, I was cut off due to technical issues. Let me continue on with my presentation. And if you look at uh, Korean studies and education in China, it involves not only language but social, cultural studies. And we have uh, BAMAs, PhDs. Uh, and also talents that are nurtured that may take on a non-academic track. And KF has offered us with immense support in the process of putting together these programs. And we would like uh, to extend our gratitude for the support offered by KF in installing, establishing professorships, uh, the libraries, scholarships, and fellowships uh, in China. Thank you once again to the Korea Foundation. In the 21st century, and particularly since 2010, science and technology, international exchange, and the policies by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of China has led to a major change in the circumstances of foreign language training and education, and this has led to many opportunities and challenges for uh, Korean education or Korean studies. And the perspective, uh, the pedagogy, and the development path has also uh, shifted in the process. The contents of education is something that's currently being innovated right now, but further innovation is necessary. This is a key task for Korean studies. So you can see that Korean studies for the past 73 years can divide it up in, can be divided up into three phases: the earlier phases, transitional phase, and the growth phase. From 2015 to 2020, for five years, if you look at uh, the journals, there were more than 800 publications. And uh, from 1994 to 2020, uh, relevant national social sciences funded projects amounted to 311. And in order to prepare for this forum, I also uh, looked into the uh, data on uh, journals, and by 2021, I was able to collect information that there are more than 800,000 dissertations and papers published in journals and more than 14,800 PhD dissertations. And then moving on to the research centers ever since diplomatic ties, there are more than 120 on Korean studies. And if you see here, we have many academic uh, associations, including those that are focused on history as well as literature. So you can see that all of these research centers host academic seminars, publish journals, uh, which actually helps us mobilize uh, the competence and expertise of uh, Korean studies scholars to promote the area. Recently, in terms of uh, development in Korean studies, uh, there was a lot of focus put on not quantity but quality. So in line with this trend, you can see that there are some new movements in terms of how we can upgrade the contents. For instance, in terms of Korean studies education, you can see that it's moving on to an education that's focused on not just practicality, but uh, in overall education that would involve all various disciplines. So it's about uh, liberal arts, having the uh, right traits, personality, and place the capability. So in other words, it's about creating an internationalized talent. And based on this direction, you can see that uh, there are many changes that we do foresee in Korean studies as well. And in terms of the students, it's now not just targeted to a specific group. In other words, in the past, you can see that Korean studies was just for those that would take the academic track. However, now you can see that there are many multidisciplinary types of programs uh, that would involve many different students with different backgrounds. And the KF eSchool program and other uh, humanities program uh, enables uh, students of different backgrounds and scholars of different backgrounds to take part in uh, the education and training. And in terms of the methodology, you can see that it's also changing form. It's not just a one-way classroom type of lecture, various 
uh, symposiums, academic seminars, and events are being held so that the students can better their understanding on Korea and also make sure that they can really dive into the comparing, compelling traits of Korean studies. There are also hybrid types of uh, education methods that are introduced uh, to maximize the effect and the impact and many attempts are being made to widen and expand the scope and horizon of the students. In terms of research, uh, it's important to make sure that uh, Korean studies research has a clear identity and if it does uh, have to do with solving pending issues of China, it's important to make sure to continue on with this research. Uh, and identifying literature on Korean studies and putting together uh, a database is something that would be necessary going forward. Not only that, integration or convergence with other disciplines and researchers that goes beyond region, background, and careers can actually help us sustain academic research as well as expand the scope of research. And it will be a win-win type of synergy when such a multidisciplinary group is formed. And not only that, by nurturing key talents, we will be able to engage in future-oriented Korean studies. Up till now, Korean studies, uh, education, and research uh, has made much progress. However, there is further progress and potential that we can reap. In order to engage in future-oriented Korean studies education and research, it's important that all of the educators and researchers in this domain need to continue on to hone their skills and their capabilities. But of course, we need direct support from KEF and the support and affection of all of you here taking part in the event. And I would like to ask for your interest and affection going forward. With that, let me conclude my presentation. Thank you very much. In the 70s and 80s in Japan, we've seen many uh, the number of students studying Korean studies uh, studying Korean studies increased uh, significantly, and you can see here in China, as it was indicated in the statistics, we're seeing a greater number of students enrolling in Korean studies. And there are also many of these students coming into Korea uh, to engage in field research. So the students uh, that engage in Korean studies and students that come to Korea and study at Korean universities uh, will be playing some key uh, roles. And I think that we, you know, policy-wise, also need to see how we can take full advantage of their potential. Let us now move on to the next presentation from the National Australia University, we have Professor Roald Maliankai. This Nida. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, so I wanted to start with a map of Australia just to show you a little bit uh, where we are all working. Um, and uh, as you can see on the map, most of us are in the kind of southeast of this region. Um, the programs that have run the longest, I guess the proper Korean studies programs, are those at UNSW, Sydney Uni, Melbourne, Monash, uh, UWA, Queensland, Auckland, and the ANU. And I'm very pleased that actually in recent years, Macquarie has really also come up uh, very strongly uh, with their activities. So as you can see here, the, um, uh, there is um, quite a concentration of people um, working on Korea in that southeastern corner. But on, if you look on in the um, um, bottom left corner, you see there's an arrow going from the University of Western Australia to Curtin University. And I'll explain in a minute why that is. Um, we have, as you could probably see in the top left corner, we have a KSAA, which is the Korean Studies Association of Australasia, which um, uh, just like um, AXI is, is a very happy uh, group uh, 
of, of people uh, working very well together. So I'm very pleased with this um, kind of union and uh, it has led to a lot of very um, positive developments in recent years. So there's, there's a lot of reasons to be cheerful. Um, um, as elsewhere, as was made clear this morning, um, enrollment numbers have really doubled or tripled. When I arrived in, um, in Canberra in 2006, I had 25 students doing Korean language, and we currently have about 300. And it's all because of me, of course. Um, whatever they say about K-pop. Um, so, thank you. Um, so in general, I think Korean studies has really become recognized as a field, uh, which is for the obvious reasons that Korean feeds are now recognized as such, and that Korea is considered a major middle power. There's also, um, I guess, less of a hierarchy uh, amongst Australian and New Zealand universities. Uh, we, we work well together. Um, there's probably people watching this online thinking, no, we don't, but we actually do. Um, and in general, I think we've also seen an increase in uh, outreach to uh, community colleges and to high schools. Um, at ANU, we recently, a few years now, uh, we've been running a so-called H course, which invites uh, high school students to come to ANU to take a course. And in exchange for the course, they get some credits that they can use to enroll. So it, it kind of uh, lowers the bar a little bit. And it's been very popular. And I'm very pleased that Curtin University has now um, um, kind of developed plans to offer a Korean studies major to online community college called Open Universities Australia. So that's a very recent, very positive development. So I just wanted to run through a few of the major new developments. So 2019, uh, the University of Queensland established a Korean studies center and then in 2020, um, the uh, University of Western Australia um, opened its Korea Research Center, and that one was incredibly productive um, and organized a lot of events uh, involving also the corporate sector. Um, and yet, despite uh, even this year, very high enrollment numbers, and not just for the language program, the university decided to get rid of all its Asian studies, which meant that the people who were there running this very successful program uh, had to kind of go to teaching only positions, which is a very sad uh, decision. But then the good news is that uh, roughly last month in uh, June this year, Curtin University uh, decided to adopt the Korea Research Center. So that's a wonderful new development. Both universities are in the same city in Perth. And so we have very good hope and we uh, work very closely with the people involved um, that uh, this center will go from strength to strength. All right, another um, kind of a uh, good development is um, the establishment of the Korean Studies Research Hub at Monash University. And there's a, a kind of similar um, thing that happened in uh, 2020 at the nearby University of Melbourne, also a Korean Studies Research Hub. Um, and at ANU, we've recently opened with the help of the very generous Korea Foundation, a Korea Corner, which I'm very pleased to, to say uh, is incredibly popular with our students. Um, Australia not really being known for good design. Um, it was nice to have this room um, so to the envy of all our colleagues who have to sit in crappy rooms designed by Australians. Don't shoot me. All right. Um, and I guess the, the thing that I'm personally really excited about because of the incredible number of new activities that, that they have been uh, undertaking, it's this KSAA Emerging Researchers Group. So that's basically a, a group of people who are either doing 
a PhD or a postdoc or basically looking for a job. Um, and they meet regularly. They've recently organized an inter international conference online. And I just saw yesterday that they were already calling people to join them again for a weekly, um, what they call shut up and write, uh, online kind of writing seminar uh, or workshop. They're incredibly active. And uh, so it's just really wonderful to have them also uh, take up one permanent position on the KSAA committee. All right, but of course it's not all good news. And so these are some of the challenges. There's a typo in here, which I apologize for. So monolingualism is uh, strong in Australia. Um, and um, this is something that we constantly face, I think. Um, I, I think it's less so in New Zealand, um, in part because of the st strong appreciation for Maori culture. Um, in Australia, it is really quite strong. And um, we also have this kind of old colonial division between lectures and tutorials, which means that in lectures, students really do not expect or appreciate being asked to respond to questions about Korean grammar in Korea. Now, and then there's a couple of other challenges uh, that other people have this morning and, and very recently uh, mentioned, like the kind of the traditional disciplines, which I call traditional, um, kind of being a, a little bit under threat. Um, there's also in Australia a very kind of strong anti-Chinese sentiment, which hasn't helped. And we've seen a real decline in the numbers of uh, young people at high schools taking up Chinese in the last two years. They've basically plummeted. And uh, I think it's great that a lot of students are still doing uh, Korean, but uh, this may have uh, a bad effect, a negative effect also on the Korean enrollments. Finally, the National Library of Australia has just decided to focus only on indigenous materials and Chinese materials, which is kind of ironic if you think that soon enough no one will be able to read it anymore. And then my last point in the slide is that the, um, yeah, the, the media in Australia are just not that interested in um, areas outside of Australia. So for all our news, we unfortunately have to go elsewhere. Um, and, and I know where to go, but a lot of my students may not. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Ma Ma Liankai. We do see many Australian students studying in Korea, and we do see an increasing number of students taking an interest in Korea, which is quite welcoming. Yes, uh, let us now move on to uh, Russia, which is also very well known for its history in Korean studies or Chosun studies. We have Professor Sergei Kurvanov. This presentation will be on progress and prospects in Korean studies in Russia. You have the floor. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I did prepare my slides in English, uh, and I, but I would like to ask uh, our interpreters for their understanding. I would like to speak in Korean, but use English slides. Uh, Korean and English, they both are not my mother tongue, but I am using um, Korean extensively here at this event, so I would like to ask the interpreters to interpret my talk in English. Uh, I do ask for your understanding. Um, so Korean studies or Chuseon studies in Russia has a very long history. And uh, there was already a lengthy discussion on Korean studies, so I will not go into that in detail. Uh, but 
I do want to mention that for those in Russia to pursue Korean studies, uh, that individual needs uh, to have knowledge of Korean language, of Hanmun, and also understanding on the culture. It's not just about English uh, and Russian, and that would be enough to engage in Korean studies, writing papers or dissertations or teaching. Uh, with just English and Russian, we do not believe are not Kore uh, true Korean study scholars. It was in the 19th century uh, when the studies first began in earnest, and Russia in the Far East has actually engaged in some active foreign affairs policies. And in, ever since 1884, at that time, uh, after concluding the Russian-Korean Friendship Tre Treaty, We've been seeing many articles and books about Korean language uh, and Korean system. And in 1896 and 1897, when uh, King Kujong escaped to the Russian legation in Seoul, we've been seeing the attention to in Korea or regarding Korea noticeably grow. And you can see that the number of books uh, were more than 100 that focused on Korean language, history, trade traditions, and the political system. And at uh, St. Petersburg Emperor's uh, University, an individual under the name of Kim byung -ok, that was a part of the Min Young Hwan delegation, started to professionally teach Korean in Russia. And in 1899, uh, the very first textbook on Korean uh, was published. And you can see here the description of Korea. This was published by the Russian Finance Agency, and it's a very famous uh, book in three volumes, and this has been translated into Korean. So you can see that there was a lot of interest by Russia, and in Vladivostok and St. Petersburg, uh, a organization under the name Oriental Institute was established. So it was particularly in Vladivostok and it implemented programs for the study of language and people of East Asia, including Korean. Uh, during the Japanese colonial, colonial rule, we did not see any active studies in earnest, but it was 1945 and onwards where here, as you can see here on the slide, we've been seeing a restoration of Korean studies in Russia. And the reason behind that is the following. In many colonial countries, after their independence, uh, chose uh, the socialist path of development. And therefore, North Korea, or DPRK, decided to uh, focus on socialism and relevant experts were necessary. So at that time, we needed those uh, that actually had uh, a broad array of knowledge, including Korean language, history, ethnology, literature, and politics. In Moscow, in Moscow State University, and um, the Military Institute, and the Leningrad State University, and the MGIMO, Moscow State Institute of International Relations, uh, started to introduce Korean language programs. And not only that, uh, there were various government institutions uh, that started to focus on uh, traditional literature of Korea. And not only that, we've seen in the uh, Sambusagi literature that was uh, translated in Russian. That was the early 60s. You can see that there is an interesting picture here. It was 19... Uh, 45, it was in mid-September, where you see the Russian soldiers and the citizens of North Korea uh, together in this event. And what I want to mention here is that initially, Russia and North Korea had a very peaceful and harmonious relationship. In and you can see here, as you all know, KF 
has uh, launched the white paper, the white book of the foreign Korean studies in 2018. It was published by Korea Foundation. And in that white book, there is an uh, insert on the background, the history of Korean studies in Russia. But what I do want to mention is that Russia has been engaging in such uh, studies but in the early 90s, relationship with uh, DPRK severed and Russia decided to get more interest in South Korea. In the early 2000s, uh, there was this new wave of Korean studies that began. And back then, it wasn't about training or education of traditional Korean or literature, Korean literature or Korean culture. It had to do with Korean pop dramas, culture. So this new Korean studies wave had to do with this uh, Korean popular modern modern culture, large scale Korean language training. And we've seen many universities establish relevant departments. And based on the support from KF, there were two organizations that came to its being. First, is the Russian Association of Universities of Korean Studies, and the other is Association of Korean Language Teachers of Russian Universities. So these two associations uh, were established, and the second organization in Russian is Okargyaru. Uh, they're very active in their domain. And as you can see here, Uh, yes, my apologies, I needed to flip the slides. So here you can see the images of this uh, new Korean studies wave. My apologies. And the Association of Korean Language Teachers of Russian University. This is a list of, of the member, some of the member associations. And you can see that these universities are running Korean studies programs. You can see that this is only 20% of uh, the universities. Uh, there is a remaining 80%. So this is just 20% of the universities in this association. And ever since the pandemic, uh, we've been seeing a growth in online education in Russia. And it's true that due to the availability of such uh, digital content and information, uh, the student didn't necessarily have to go to a university or college, but rather utilize these uh, digital channels. So whether it be Sejong Institute, St. Petersburg University, or Moscow State University, they were able to take these courses um, via digital means. So what about the prospects now? Korean literature and the Korean language, I think, has great prospects. However, unfortunately, we believe that we're not seeing many academic pursuit of Korean studies as much as we wanted to see. In the 20 to 30 years, you can see that there was a lot of translation done for Korean literature. So you can see that it's very popular. Uh, you can see the Korean literature translated into Russian in 1990 to 2020. So this is the bibliography of Korean literature. So you can see that there's a lot of interest in literature. But in terms of the academic pursuit, I think that uh, there's some room for improvement. Um, so you can see that Korean literature translation, Korean culture, um, it all has some good prospects. However, we don't see uh, many volunteers that actually want to begin a professional life in the sphere of academic activities. So in the case of history, culture, linguistics, well, excluding modern history, but if you look at these areas, the classical academic studies domain, it's uh, not as bright because if you look at the graduates, they do not want to pursue an academic career. In many of the cases, they opt for to work for Korean companies or schools. So in Russia, we believe that it, it, it may be faced with challenges. So in these um, academic classical studies, we do believe that Korea and abroad, and especially the support from KF would be critical going forward. Thank you very much.
Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor, for going through the situation of Russia in a very short span of time. Let us now move on. We have Professor Tang Ho Jong from the CAS UIR and WL. He will present on the current status and outlook for Korean studies in Central Asia. Good afternoon. I am Tang Ho Jong from CAS UIR and WL. I did not prepare a slide deck, and I would. I only have the uh, paper that I submitted. I think that you can just uh, refer to my paper for further information, and I would like to just present on a few important points. When you think of Central Asia, many are find it quite unfamiliar. Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Turkmenistan are the Central Asian countries. Um, you might have only heard Uzbekistan, and many are confused. Many confuse uh, Ukraine with Uzbekistan, but there are five countries located in Central Asia. They, they became independent from the Soviet Union in the 1990s, and that was when the Korean studies began in these countries. But before then, during the Soviet days, there were Korean studies ongoing, but I would just like to focus on the post-independence Korean studies in Central Asia. And I will not be delving into this topic, but the five Central Asian nations, including Kazakhstan, are just considered to be Central Asia here in Korea, but they have different political, social uh, situations. So we cannot say that the five countries have a very strong similarity, but um, Korea, in Korea, the Central Asian region is just uh, considered to be a single group that share the language of Russian and that there are many ethnic Koreans uh, living in the region. So, in page 168, there's the introduction and the current status of Korean studies in Central Asia. The challenges to Korean studies in Central Asia are often mentioned. There are many Korean studies, universities that offer Korean studies programs across a wide, scattered across a wide region, and therefore um, cooperation and exchanges among these different universities is quite difficult to reach. And because the faculty has very low wage, there are very few students who want to pursue a career, academic career, and even if they become a faculty member pursuing new research or providing education are not very easy to do. It is not, there's no motivation to pursue such a path. And these challenges are commonly mentioned um, in this region. And from 2003 to 2008, I studied at the Novorosk University in Russia and after that in Kazakhstan. In 2003 or 2005, the St. Petersburg National University um, hosted a academic conference. That's the school of Mr. Kurbanov. And even then, most of the CIS countries shared the same challenges. Um, the wage is too low and the workload is too heavy for faculty. And so it is very difficult to foster a pool of faculties and support must come from Korea. But 20 years later, the challenge remains the same. And so, in the early 1990s, as uh, Central Asia became independent from um, the Soviet Union, Korean language and education became quite robust, and there's a wider base and demand for Korean education, but there is not enough faculty members, and plus, um, those who do join the faculty uh, find other jobs and they do not work out of a sense of mission because of the harsh working conditions. In addition, this June, 
So, uh, with the at the Tashkent Tashkent State University of Oriental Studies, uh, there was an international conference held, sponsored by the Moscow office of KF which since 2013 has proposed the formation of the Association of Korean Studies Professors in Central Asia or AKSPCA and has always been sponsoring our international conferences. So if you can refer to page 170, you can see that since 2013, uh, we have had the very first Korean Studies Conference. And this year, in 2022, we held the 10th conference. And from the first um, academic conference, although I cannot give you all the details, we have had an annual conference and we also publish a regular journal and a newsletter on our website. So after submitting this paper to KF, I was not able to uh, see, but um, I understand that uh, the hyperlinks in the paper do not work. So please um, see if you can fix this. If you go to page 171, at the eighth uh, conference, the at the Central Asian uh, conference, the topic was how to address the challenges presented by COVID-19. So, in many universities in Central Asia, uh, there are Korean programs offered, but this is not really operating properly. First of all, because uh, it is very difficult to provide online courses, and plus there are the there's the time difference, particularly with Korea, about three to four hours, and the universities do not have in sufficient. Um, online lecture equipment in place, and it is difficult to develop uh, teaching materials. So because of these challenges, we came together and discussed how to address the challenges presented by COVID and the online courses. But having discussions does not mean that we found the clear solutions. But in the ninth conference, we continue to discuss developing faculty and re-educating faculty. So we continue to address the same topic in a more deeper way throughout our conferences. And on page 172, uh, you can see that the 10th conference was held in June at the Tashkent State University of Oriental Studies. Although I am located in uh, Kazakhstan, the Tashkent State University of Oriental Studies celebrated the 30th anniversary of KF, but also the 30th anniversary of Korean Studies program there. This uh, university has the College of Korean Studies in place. There are many students there, and not only the Uzbekistan University of Oriental Studies, but at my own school of CAS UIRNWL, has, there's a large pool of students. So if you look at the first table, on 172, there you can see the number of students for different Korean studies majors. And on 173, table 2, you can see that in 2012, um, the stu there were about 140 students, but now that has grown to a 377. So in a short period of time, um, the number of students really grew very rapidly. The faculty also increased as well. If you look at the table four, um, the total number of faculty was only 12 in 2012, but that grew to 24 this year. So the 12 people in 2012 also included three volunteer workers from Koika. 
But now, uh, the Koika office has shut down, and still we have 24 faculty members. So these were the uh, current status of Korean studies in Central Asia. Uh, I did not uh, segregate the Korean language education and Korean studies, but um, Central Asia, I don't think there's really a full-blown Korean studies in um, Central Asia. Right now, Korean language education is starting to grow in the region. So Korean studies, only the, all the faculty in Korean studies are linguistics experts and majors teaching Korean language and literature. So to conclude, when I went to Kazakhstan for the first time and when I attended the very first conference, I felt that in order for Korean studies to in develop not only KF but AKS or Academy of Korean Studies and many other uh, organizations that have made a long investment are still continuing to provide support but even so the conclusion of these types of conferences remain the same. Support must continue from Korea in order for Korean studies to develop and Korean studies are in a stagnant state and we need more support from Korea and so on. What I would like to say is that yes, of course, we do need support at our university. Based on the support of Korean organizations, we were able to increase the number of students and the faculty. But support from Korea is only finite. So how much support you can get, for how long, um, for what range, that is all limited and there's no, there, there will be an end to such support. So the subject of support and the purpose and the carry it all, we need to think about all these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Chang, for your presentation, for going through the situation in Central Asia. The number of Central Asian students studying here in Korea is actually continuing to grow. So I think that in terms of exchanges between the two, uh, the Central Asian countries and Korea is at least growing. <laughs> Uh, next, uh, I would like to invite Professor uh, Ki Hong Hwang, a former KF visiting professor, for his uh, presentation on Korean studies in Western Africa. Uh, for 15 years, I worked at a university uh, that had no relevance with um, Korean studies, but then I went to Africa and I started uh, my pursuit in Korean studies. So it's been, so at that time, 15 years back, I started to uh, gain interest in Korean studies. When I first began uh, my journey in Africa, I, there are two things that come to mind. It was early in the 80s. Uh, there was a Center for American Studies at the time, and I remembered a book that I borrowed at the time. And then when I studied abroad, uh, at um, University of Paris 7, we had I had acquaintance with students uh, that pursued linguistics. Uh, so it actually reminded me of the book uh, and the efforts of the students when I was engaging in area studies in Africa, and it also enlightened me in my work. Compared to China, Russia, and Europe, which has a very long history, Africa. Uh, and the university that I worked for at that time, I, of course, I cannot represent the entire African continent, but it was in the Western African region, and it was an university that first started uh, its endeavors in Korean studies. So it was about starting everything from zero uh, ground. It was uh, from scratch. So it started off with how we're going to engage in education, research, and 
what kind of employment opportunities can we offer to our students and how we can engage in industrial collaboration. So this was all a first uh, for all in all friends. And there was a lot of um, thought that had to be put into it. So we first started off as area studies or Korean studies. I am an economist. And I believe that Korean studies and the dissemination of Korean studies had to do with the economic growth of Korea. In Africa, many people would ask, how was, able, how was Korea able to achieve its economic success? So my response was the following. And there is no growth or development DNA particular to Korea. It was just that there was some active investments in the economy. So in terms of economic development and cooperation, I believe that the Ivory Coast or Cote d'Ivoire of um, Africa uh, was uh, the region that I first started off with in Africa. And I think that my beginning here in this Western Africa was quite particular. Uh, and I think that in lieu of time, I have to go into the conclusion before I go into the details. But what I do want to mention is that the economic development cooperation uh, between Korea and Africa is actually getting more active. And I was in the I was also involved in development cooperation with Africa and the experience of uh, economic success of Korea and sharing that with Africa uh, was an important background in Korean studies in Western Africa. So of course, I put in good thought on what Korean studies should be all about in Western Africa. Uh, what's the meaning that Africa has for Korea? Well, the first thing that I witnessed in Africa was that uh, there were remnants of colonial rule. I was able to witness this for myself. I saw some direct impact and damage, and some of that actually impacts the people there still. But there are also indirect but significant impact, psychological, ethical impact it had on Africa. So in other words, culture how that impacts uh, po uh, politics, economy, uh, the society was the question I had in mind. And I will be mentioning this in my conclusion, but Korea in the 21st century, how should it communicate with the rest of the world? How should it go in partnership was something that I really started to think about back then. As mentioned, I'm an economist, and I just may put it quite simply, uh, the economic growth of Korea. And I thought that mutual prosperity was a good thing. It's about mutual growth, uh, mutual benefits, and if it helps uh, each other, and it helps both sides, I thought that then that was the right way to go. So in the development cooperation uh, process, you can see that uh, the advanced nations uh, really need to recollect uh, the colonial ruled colonial situation of countries. And I thought that well, Korean studies, well, this was something that really in, in enlightened me in the morning session. It was mentioned by Secretary General Han that the meaning of Korean studies have to do with enhancing the intellectual and ethical collaboration of the world. And I also believe that Korean studies can actually contribute to enhancing and promoting universal values and also to make sure that Korean studies is not swayed by capital or by industrial forces. Um, originally, you can see that Korean studies uh, or the culture uh, was not uh, that well received because Africa believed that not music and dance, they were the first, that they actually had uh, the tradition. Uh, but rather than culture, dance, music, it was more about Korea's technology. And uh, as a country of economic success, um, Africans perceived Korea's merit there. Uh, so Ivory Coast, or Cote d'Ivoire, in 2017 started the very first degree program in Korean studies in West Africa. And in the case of the university that I started off with, is a very big university under the name of Felix Hupet Boykne University with 13 colleges and 60,000 students. In 2017, uh, we established a department on Korean studies. And if you look at the current, uh, if you look at the status uh, divided up into faculty and students, you can see that we have Korean faculty and local faculty. And recently, the KFE schooling support was offered due to COVID. 
And if you look at the students, you can see that uh, we've engaged in a multidisciplinary approach. So philosophy, uh, business management, economics uh, is all encompassed in this department. So it has a wide spectrum. And for all of the students, a uh, monthly $100 of scholarship was offered. And we tried to, to do as much as possible to invite foreign um, students. And then moving on to education and research. Well, initially, we had a graduate school course of two years. So that was the first uh, course. Uh, and of course, it's true that Korean language took on the lion's share at that time because Korean studies actually uh, has a close link to Korean language proficiency. And fortunately enough, we had many supporters in the process. We had uh, KF uh, and Academy of Korean Studies that have played a pivotal role in building our program. And we also had Quaker and University of Paris uh, that has collaborated along the way. Our education target or goal was to better understanding on Korea and Africa and uh, to nurture talents that can contribute to mutual exchange development uh, and with high ethical standards and level of knowledge. And because we wanted to invite foreign students and in order to encompass Western Africa, I mean, in other words, uh, Western Africa is a French speaking region and we wanted to create a full network uh, of students in this area. So in terms of training, Korean language proficiency was a critical matter that we had to overcome. So we focused on an integrated approach and we had to really focus on the functional elements of linguistics. Um, and East Asia was not a separate discipline or East Asian studies was not a separate discipline. So some of the Africans uh, may uh, wonder why do we have to study Korea? So that's why we've actually included humanities education in Korean studies to better their understanding on the necessity. And then education on economics and business management. There are a lot of courses and classes on this uh, to uh, harness the capabilities of students. We also had seminars and conferences. Uh, and we've uh, received uh, immense support from the AKSC uh, project. And because uh, the key theme that uh, our African colleagues were interested in had to do with the economic growth of um, Korea, uh, we've had these regular seminars that focused on innovation and a structural transition of the society, uh, innovation and governance, and we held conferences. Uh, so depending on the background of the students, uh, they selected their topics uh, for research dissertations and we offered supervision and guidance. Uh, it's important to increase the base and foundation of students. So what we did was create groups of students and groups of experts. And for groups of students, we've had uh, the Franco Honey group of Aja University, the Department of um, French Language and Literature, and uh, that was involved and there were also corporations, governments, international organizations uh, that were involved uh, with the expert group. You can see that we've engaged in all sorts of activities, including these quizzes, um, uh, competitions, um, putting in place a day on Korean cultures, or many cultural activities. So going forward, we believe that it's important to share our experience in IT. So this is the task going forward. And last year, just before I left uh, the region. I well, was very proud of the fact that we had an OD program that had to do with putting together a IT database in the universities. Information infrastructure is key and I think that we need to further share literature or study outcome, but I came to find out that there could be some IPR issues in the process. But at any rate, uh, we, with uh, French scholars, have continued on to put together uh, a researcher infrastructure uh, or a network uh, of researchers. But due to COVID, there were some difficulties and hindrances. So going forward, we, we do need to nurture further resources, research, resource talent. But what's most important is to have these countries have uh, put in place the right infrastructure so that they can stand on their own two feet and to continue on uh, and follow up on the existing programs. So my last slide here 
that I wanted to emphasize was that, uh, financially speaking, uh, African countries are met with a uh, difficulty. So it's true that they always needed some financial support up to a certain extent. And then KF and AKS, I think, uh, can um, become the wings of the programs that can help not take the next leap forward, but at least help build the foundation in this region. So they've actually done that. And I would like to thank you for your assistance. So going forward uh, on the challenges of Korean studies here in Western Africa, Korea is an IT power. So the uh, the way of operation, methods, uh, and way of teaching, I think, uh, can be all the more enhanced uh, by utilizing the technologies of a hyper-connected world or hyper-intelligent society. It's true that, well, K-pop could be a gateway, and I'm not exactly sure whether we can actually divide up K-pop and culture, but I think that we, meet, we need some more talk on that. And through digital technologies of Korea, I think that we need to find ways to introduce media uh, and uh, mode of operation to disseminate and expand Korean studies. And as I've already mentioned, uh, I think that it's important to find a way for Korean studies to pursue uh, the universal values of humanity. Uh, and I hope that we can engage in some further discussions as to how con Korean studies can contribute in the process. Thank you. The next presenter is uh, Dr. Sarah Benjamin. And sometimes when we have these Korean studies conferences with uh, North America, North Africa, uh, we often come across um, scholars, but it is, would be a rare opportunity to listen to the case for Sub-Saharan Africa. And I hope that we will hear more about the regional studies in this region. And now moving on to the next uh, presentation, we have Dr. Benjamin, please. Thank you very much. As introduced, I am Sarah Benjamin. And I would like to introduce to you the current status of a university in Egypt. And before I start my presentation, I would like to thank KF for preparing this event and also uh, President Egan of KF for always sending support and encouragement to our school. So I would like to speak in English and I ask for you for your understanding. So I'm going to give my presentation in English, and I'm going to start talking about um, the location of Egypt and the importance of this strategic location, because um, Egypt is kind of acting as a hub for Korean industry, uh, Korean economy, and there's a growing interest between Egypt and Korea uh, in a lot of fields. And that's why um, the Korean department is very important, and it's kind of... Um, the employment rate of our department graduates is almost 90%, and there's always good job opportunities with good income. So a lot of Egyptian uh, students are aiming to learn Korean and work in um, this field. Um, and even though our department's history is not that um, long, because it dates to 2005, as you can see here, um, we have graduated a, a large number, um, relatively large, but smaller than other uh, departments worldwide. And um, throughout these years, the department has grown rapidly and it has attracted a lot of students uh, so far. Um, I'm going to give you a, a brief idea on Korean education in Egypt and where you can actually learn Korean. There are two um, categories for uh, Korean courses. The first category is just a Korean language course, and it's provided in several universities, not as a major language, just a, a course to help them in employment later after graduation. Um, and then the second um, uh, type of 
um, Korean courses is, of course, the Korean language and literature department. Currently, we have three departments in three different universities all over Egypt. The primary one, of course, is Enchant University. Um, the second one is in Aswan, that's in the south, and it's a touristic site. Um, this department is actually open and accepting students, and last year they had their first class of graduates. It doesn't have a long history. Um, the other two departments, Sohag University and Kafir Sheikh University, they wanted to open Korean departments, but there's no faculty members. So the departments are established, but not running yet. So our hope is to encourage um, these departments to work um, in the future and attract more students. Um, so if you look here at the map, you will see uh, the various Korean courses provided all over Egypt according to the map, so it's everywhere almost. And uh, the, of course, there's a huge number of students who want to learn Korean, but um, we are facing two problems. The first problem is that the number is too huge and they cannot all enroll in the available departments. And the second um, problem is that we have a very limited number of professors and, and instructors. So we are unable to provide um, um, pr courses all over Egypt. Either a Korean professors come to Egypt and start teaching or um, the limited number of professors are supposed to um, serve all of these locations. Um, now I'm going to focus on Ain Shams University, where I belong. Um, the Korean department is open at the Faculty of Alsun, which means languages, Faculty of Languages, and it has about 17 departments. Um, the Korean department is the second most recent uh, department uh, established in 2005, and then followed by the Portuguese department that was established in 2019, so it's pretty um, recent. Um, the number of professors that we have are four, um, two professors are provided by Korea Foundation, so we, all, we are always thankful to Korea Foundation. Um, and the other two are locals with um, PhD holders, one linguistics, which is me, and the other uh, colleague uh, has a PhD in literature, so we are trying to provide courses for all uh, specialties of the department that I'm going to talk about in a minute. And then we have um, two lecturers, Korean lecturers, uh, who volunteer to give Korean courses, maybe one course or two courses for undergraduate students. And the rest are lecturers, TAs, who are um, employed by our university or our locals, but they are currently working on their research for masters and PhD. Um, our department is very popular, and it's kind of highly competitive to get in. So every year there's about 3,000 students that apply for the Faculty of Languages, but only 30 students can get in the, the department. So it's kind of um, 1,000 or 2,000 students applying, and we take just those who have the high scores. That's why it helps them in studying Korean and like having um, good Korean proficiency at the end of the four years. We provide um, courses for linguistics, literature, and translation, and all of these courses are mandatory for undergraduates. Um, okay, I'm going to talk briefly about the number of students. We don't have a lot of students, 128 from year one to year four, and for the graduate program, we have only 16 students, among which 11 students are currently working on their research and the rest are taking undergraduate courses. But most of those 11 graduate students are employed by the university to later on be promoted and become professors after obtaining their degrees. And for the undergraduate program, the courses that are provided are well, literature, linguistics, grammar, um, conversation and listening, translation and interpretation, and that's what they, kind, that's what they work with after graduation. And of course, history and Chinese characters, and all students must take all these courses throughout the four years. As for the graduate program, um, we don't have a lot of Korean professors, just two, and we have like a big number of um, graduate students, relatively. So it's kind of a lot of work for them to supervise all of the research and give lectures, and like, it's a, it's a lot of work. So. 
there's a growing demand for faculty members because if we help those graduate students to graduate, they're going to obtain their PhD degrees and then start working in other universities and opening more courses for more Egyptians to learn and so we can fulfill the market demand for uh, employment. But there's always this dialogue, is it more important to um, nurture Korean uh, Egyptian professors of Korean language or is it better to just um, have our graduate students work um, and get employed by companies and not work in Korean studies. Um, but if we look at it this way, it's kind of more important to develop Egyptian professors because later on they will help increase the number of Korean learners in the region. And so um, I'm going to focus on the process of developing Korean professors. So once the students graduate after finishing their four-year program. Uh, they become TAs and then after obtaining their master's, they become assistant lecturers and then assistant professors after obtaining their PhD. And that's when they can start to uh, supervise um, academic research. And then after doing more research, associate professors and professors, and it's kind of the, the same worldwide. So the graduate school, our graduate school, school is the most important um, thing that we need to focus on right now. And I conducted a short survey to assess how our graduate students are doing. And um, I pointed to three main points. The first one was whether the quality of education for undergraduate uh, students is good or not. And they gave positive feedback the second one was the quality of education for a graduate program, and most of them pointed to the problem of the very limited number of Korean professors who are available at the moment. And also we have another problem is that limited number of professors, they major in linguistics, so we are currently conducting research in linguistics only, but this doesn't fulfill the other two majors that we need to um, satisfy, which are um, interpretation, translation, and literature. But we're aiming to solve this problem. So starting in the fall semester, we're going to open grad school for literature to help develop the balance between literature and linguistics. Um, so uh, due to, also due to the lack of resources, the students are unable to conduct their research quickly. And so they're having like a slow pace in the development of um, their career. And Moving on from this problem, I'm going to talk about the characteristics of our department. This point has been brought up several times throughout the um, conference today. Um, whether research should be conducted in Korean or is it possible to conduct it in English if it's related to Korean studies? Um, I cannot give an answer to that, but I'm going to talk about what we do at the department. We conduct all courses, all research in Korean, and we try to improve um, language proficiency as well as academic um, career of the students. Um, yeah. And then I'm going to talk about the activities that we have. Our department is very popular, so we have lots of events like the Korean Cultural Day and Hangul Nal, and we have also some, the, the Middle Eastern African Korean Studies Seminar, which was conducted for five years until before the pandemic. And uh, we have like the International Speech Contest. And then lately we had a YouTube channel as a collaboration with the Korean Embassy in Egypt, where we started to give content in Korean about Egyptian culture and try to um, compare between Egyptian culture and Korean culture to give better understanding for both um, nations. And then here, this was the highlight of this year. We had the presidential visit in January and most of our students or um, graduates of the department participated in this event, whether as interpreters or translators or news monitoring or yeah, different tasks were given. So we were very proud of our graduates. And for the future development of the department, simply put, we need to increase the number of Korean professors to develop a very strong graduate program. And through this program, we're going to have a new generation of Egyptian professors who can start teaching Korean studies all over Egypt in different universities. So um, I'm going to end my presentation here. This is the um, end, and thank you for this opportunity. Yeah.
Thank you very much for that succinct uh, presentation. So that is all for the presentation. And uh, the presentations for uh, sharing with us the important issues in different regions and universities. So if you have any questions or comments, please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I listened to Professor Chang Ho-jung's presentation and I do have a comment. Uh, I could not agree with the level and quality of the faculty. Uh, we never discussed that point. Um, and we just discussed the shortage of faculty, and in particular, the traditional universities in Russia, such as St. Petersburg, Vladivostok, or Moscow University, with history of more than 100 years, they have a very high quality of faculties. They're very well known around the world, and graduates uh, participate in the Russian writing essay contest, and they receive top awards from the end of 19th century and until today, I went through the brief history of Korean studies because reading the books in these big cities, um, people can be teach themselves to become experts. There are many books available, starting from Korean language, economy to classics, the ancient history. And some of these Russian books are translated into Korean. For instance, books on the Kojoseon and, and on relations between Russia and Korea. But the challenge is for newly established universities is that they do not have any foundation. But during the 120 years, there are many, many books available that are not yet available online. This will be a big task to do and the 120 years worth of resources will be published online and translated into different languages for people to have access and actually teach themselves to become very high quality faculty members. Thank you. Uh, so with regard to shifting to online uh, and putting together a database, I would like to understand, do you have any plans for investments? So in other words, uh, by the government or whether by the university, is there a certain budget that is in place? to engage in that online transition. So in the case of St. Petersburg State University, in our library, we have well, 300 uh, traditional books or, or literature that's currently being scanned. And what we will be doing is from the 17th century to the 20th century, uh, we're going to have this archived online and it's going to soon enough, soon enough be completed within the year. And it started off with the support from Academy of Korean Studies, but in the recent three years, we've been continuing on with this project uh, with the university financing. Uh, so we do understand the challenge, and uh, we've been putting in our best efforts, and soon enough, we would be able to actually have access to traditional Korean literature and use that information for research in using our archives. So, uh, we, we, in the interest of time, it is all right with you. We would like to open up the floor at this time. If you have any questions or comments about the presentations or this presentations, please raise your hands so that we can bring you a microphone. 
Yes, we have a gentleman over here. Please introduce yourself. Hello. I am from Sohan University Global Korean Studies Department. I am Han Alexander. It was very interesting to listen to the development of Korean studies in different parts of the world. Thank you very much for your presentations. I have a question for Professor Kurbanov. And Professor, as you know very well, the Russian-Ukraine war and the conflict. I would like to mention that. And Korea has been designated as a state that goes against Russia. So I would like to understand how can academic cooperation with Russia be possible in the fear in the sphere of Korean studies? Thank you. Yes, thank you for that question. And there are two points that I would like to make. First of all, do you know Park Noja? And 10 years back, um, he became, uh, he naturalized as a Korean and is currently at the North University, North, or Oslo University of Norway. And he said that Norway finds it difficult to collaborate with Russian institutions. However, uh, mentioned that uh, we can always personally contact and invite you, uh, Professor Kurvanov, to Norway uh, for your presentations. So I believe that it's the same case for Russia and Korea. Uh, it may be difficult in terms of institutional collaboration, but in the uh, but as a personal scholar, collaboration and cooperation is still possible. So in we have. Uh, Koreans that do want to go to Russia or for those that work for Hyundai um, Motor Group, for instance, uh, dispatched to the Russian branch uh, can actually seek a visa, uh, go enter into uh, Russia uh, to engage in whatever, in, in whatever business that they have with Russia. Uh, we do have a solid relationship in the private sector and uh, the two governments also say that it's important to continue on with your relationship in the private sector in your uh, respective positions. So they've been promoting that, although uh, the relationship in the public side may be different. So you can see that we and we have the Moscow office of KF still working actively and I will be receiving uh, support on the Korea related publications going forward uh, by the foundation so I do want to mention that in terms of um, a private sector diplomacy um, cooperation it will not be impacted uh, public and private is se uh, separate different and the governments are active to support these endeavors in the private sector and these personal connections of groups I am Yi Guang Chur from KF I am in charge of Korean studies and fellowship programs. Um, Professor Chang's presentation um, gave me a sense of burden. I do understand that there is a great uh, demand growing that has grown in Central Asia for Korean studies, and that has been mentioned by Professor Malai and uh, uh, Professor Fiore from Bologna University. But the region we see uh, an explosive growth in Korean studies is Central Asia in Vietnam and other Asian nations in the past 
decade, there has been a very rapid growth of interest in Korean studies. But when it comes to China and other countries, we did uh, provide greater support. And they are starting to ha develop their own um, capabilities to uh, develop Korean studies on their own. But in Central Asia, it's structurally very challenging to provide support, but there's a huge demand. And because the scholars leave the university, the faculty remains quite limited. And starting from a couple of years back, we have initiated new projects to provide better support, but we still have a lot of work to do. But in terms of the finances, 30 years ago when we started supporting Korean studies projects, we focused mostly on North America, particularly the U.S. I think the out of the total budget of KF, 80% of support went to North America. North America took up 80% of our entire um, global pro projects. But in the past 10 to 15 years, this share went down to 60% or less than 40% now. That means we have more resources freed up to be available to Central Asia, Southeast Asia, and MENA region, and we have done so. Um, and also, in terms of um, absolute numbers, we do provide far greater support to these regions now. And for Central Asia, we are a we have been able to increase the dispatch of faculty, and we provide a far greater amount of scholarships. And it's not just KF, but the Academy of Korean Studies and the King Sejong Institute uh, that also boosted their Korean Studies program. And as Professor Huang has mentioned earlier, these types of Korean Studies abroad, how, how long do we have to keep on providing support and how far can we continue to increase the amount that is supported? Well, these are questions that we ask ourselves at KF. But I'm not saying that we are just about to reduce support. But I wanted to just give you a comment on your presentation. In five years' time, if the same challenges remain in Central Asia, and that can very well be the case, but um, I would like to say that not only KF, but AKS is represented here, as well as the King's Hejong Institute. Professor Lee Hae Young, President Lee Hae Young, is here today as well, and the Translation Institute also. So, relevant organizations within the limited resources will have to make our projects more strategic and efficient and among our organizations we need to communicate better and work together and ultimately work toward, together towards resolving the challenges that you have raised, Professor Zhang. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. And we have used up all our time. We are actually a few minutes behind schedule, so if you have any burning questions on your mind, yes, can you please? Uh, so I did not talk about localization in my presentation, but seven years back, the focus was on when would be the point of localization. I thought that about we would we would need about ten years, but this cannot be generalized. Uh, but I was thinking, up to what extent do we need to offer support? Of course, uh, there would be some limitations in these responsible investments. And considering the explosive demand, it would be very difficult to provide support on all fronts. Uh, so Korean studies that need to continue on with this collaboration with the citizens, with the public and the private sector and next to expand its horizon. And I believe that in that aspect, the impact of K-pop could be key. If you think about localization, uh, there would be the day when Korean studies would now go beyond the hands of Koreans uh, or the forces of Koreans. Metamorphosis is about a complete, complete transition and um, turning into a completely new form. And I think that this is something that we also need to take into account in Korean studies. Yes, thank you. I think that we don't have a lot of time because we have to move on to the next session. But 
I do want to uh, mention to the audience that there will also be a general discussion session at the very end of all, uh, all of the presentations, so please use that time afterwards later in the afternoon. Uh, I would like to thank all of the speakers uh, for their contributions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank Professor Kim dong Tae for moderating the session and all the um, panelists for sharing the issues in their respective regions. Please give another warm round of applause.